y'all. Welcome back. We're in the shop and you may see this sweet respirator I'm wearing. That's because we're back at doing fiberglass for our Swiss Six boat. Now, it's been a little while, but I found the original documentation about this boat and a little bit of the information from the original manufacturer about the Swiss Six, uh, you know, manufacturing locations, manufacturing dates, a little bit about the capacity of the boat. Now, this particular one is the, the Swiss Six Standard. There are three. There's the Swiss Six Economy, the Swiss Six Standard, and then your Creme de la Creme, which is easily recognizable because it has a bump strip along the side. So if ever you're looking at any of these uh, Swiss boats, uh, Swiss Craft boats, not Swiss Craft, the Swiss Craft, but the U.S. company Swiss Craft the, from Illinois, um, they are uh, going to be very similar to this boat. So it's really hard to tell the difference. But this boat was specced pretty well, and it could handle up to a 100 horsepower two-stroke motor back in the day. Now we're putting a 70 uh, two-stroke on it, high output. Essentially all that means is we'll get about 40 miles an hour out of it if we're lucky. It'll be a bit of a water pig um, with the weight, uh, so it'll kind of plow through the water a little. It has a pretty flat bottom um, in comparison to a lot of the deep V hulls, this would not be considered a deep V hull by any means. It's more like a um, like a bay liner, um, well, certain bay liners. It's got more of a blunted nose on it, so it can cut through that water nice and clean. Refer to other videos if you're curious. But uh, one big thing that's been holding us back about these projects has been I've been busy. I've been busy building my cabinets uh, that hold the, you know, the things that click, click, boom, boom, send things down a range. Uh, those are RFID locking cabinets that also have a coat rack integrated into them. And Journeyman Outfitter will be coming out with a bedside table version. That's coming up this January. I'm playing around with a couple designs and I don't want to jump the gun on it. <laughs> but. Uh, stay tuned. Those will be out. Uh, I'm sure I'll post a video about it, but back to the most important part. Boat. So we've got our center stringer and our two outer stringers. We are going to foam fill this uh, in between the stringers. The reason we want to do that is for buoyancy of the boat, and high-end boats tend to have a thud when they hit the water. Um, Low-end boats tend to have a hollow smack when they hit the water. If you've been in a lot of boats, you know what I'm talking about. Don't look at me like I'm crazy, even though I definitely am. So we're going to foam fill that with some expanding marine foam, and then we're going to do groove channels down the center of each foam fit, uh, a foam strip. And then what that's for is air gap. You need to be able to pass air between each side, each stringer, because if you can't pass air between them, what's going to happen is it could pressurize. Uh, not explode or anything, but you don't want any connections or bonds between the fiberglass to give way. So this is just going to ensure that doesn't happen. So we've gone ahead and done these two so I can figure it out and not fumble around with it. We're going to go ahead and jump onto the uh, starboard side and get cracking at that so you can see that with your own eyes. Let's get to it. Next up, go ahead and grab up your piece of 2 by 4 and now it's best to buy these and then let them dry. You never want to just buy one and try to put it in immediately um, because you tend to uh, get a little dangerous that way, so it's best to always let it dry. Alright, so a couple of special things you're going to need for this. First going to be a wooden wedge along with some sort of spacer. Now I'm using a wheel <laughs> a wheel spacer for spacing this, but you can use whatever you'd like. And really all I'm doing is attempting to get this in a vertical fashion. It does not have to be perfect. This is more just as a point of reference to allow me to start the uh, measurements. Now I'm going to put the respirator away because we're a couple minutes away from fiberglassing, so no rush there. Alright, so this is pretty cool the way this works. The only two tools you really need to get these measurements is a small stiff measuring tool and a pencil, pen, marker, crayon, 
anything they can write. Now, it's really easy to do this. You'll notice this piece of wood sitting here is, it's got its nose up to where, as far up as it's gonna be, and then it kind of gradually comes back down. Now, I already know my transom is, a, uh, is just a gap of six millimeters at the top as opposed to the bottom touching. So all you do for that is you take your piece of wood, you, at the top you or bottom, you measure in six millimeters, make a mark, and then you just cut an angle uh, from that point to the tip of the wood. That gets you your reverse angle to the transom. That's the first thing that we're gonna do um, along with this cut here, which is the kind of most important. Now you'll notice that there is a gradual sweep up to the tip. Now, a lot of people tend to do a standard arc. The problem with the standard arc is it's uh, bulbous in some areas. So the, what uh, they recommend doing is a line, a line, a line, a line. What that does is allows you to see closer to where to knock off a little extra, and you also have measuring points, kind of points along the line that give you a reference. So what we're gonna first do is find our deepest point um, of gap. So a couple ways to do this, you can stick three fingers in, or how many ever you can fit, and just slide it around till you feel the wood snug on your fingers. So I'm finding here, so right here and right here are where my fingers are touching, uh, where the wood's starting to squeeze my fingers together. So what that means is in between these two points is most likely our lowest spot in this wood. Now the outside, or uh, in my case the outside, but in the centermost section where the floor is dipping downward, that is your lowest, lowest point. So it's pretty easy the way I do this. I take the measuring tool, set it on there. Now I can't get in there, but what I can do is with a pencil, make a mark on the ruler at the lowest point, or what I feel is the lowest point, and then look at it. So I may mark that 58. So I'm going to 58 here. And I'm going to wipe off the pencil. And I'm going to measure again in a little different spot. Now I'm I got 60. Wipe off the mark. Move down a little. Make my mark again at 59. mark and we do drop down to 57. So it looks like 60 millimeters is our lowest point. <clears throat> That's pretty straightforward, pretty easy to measure. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to measure the gap on the outside of the nose up here at the, the end of the stringer. So the same method, use a pencil, and I got 24. So 24 on the outside and zero on the inside. Now what that tells me is that the gap between the uh, highest point and the lowest point is 24 millimeters, which means that angle between uh, the left and right side is a difference of 24. So your deepest point will be 24 millimeters more than your tallest point, only in this circumstance, which is why I'm having to do the port side and starboard side separately and not just using one to make the other because that style won't work. We've got to do them each one. Now, there is a gradual slope between the center section here and the back. Okay, so just cutting the nose is not going to be a big enough difference for us uh, to get the measurement that we need. So what I'm going to do is mark a line here uh, right in the center and we know that 60 millimeters is our, our gap. So that means we need to go from here up to the tallest point there and be able to hit 60 millimeters. Now, you would think to yourself, easy enough, but there's one more very important detail to keep in mind. That detail is that this stringer has to be in line with the other stringers. So how do you do that? How do you make sure that this cut isn't going to make one stringer shorter than the other stringers. That is where a magnetic level comes into place. So 
You just grab any magnetic level and you magnetize a sheet of metal on it. Now in this case, this metal is just to allow me to have a point of reference, a mark point. So we're going to set that right on the center stringer and we're going to get a level spot. We're going to make sure that the um, stringer's level and we're going to make a mark on the wood. So that mark is the lowest that you can cut the wood. Now, the difference here is you essentially, to get the, I just made a mark and the mark really doesn't indicate anything other than the height difference. So what we're going to do now is measure from that mark to the hull of the boat. What that mark is going to give us is the maximum cut uh, of how deep the wood has to be. So we can't cut the wood any shallower than that. And in this case, we're actually going to leave a little extra that extra will ensure that we don't screw something up. All right, let's fit that in. Put a wedge back. temperature obviously low so we got a little bit of heat in here to try to keep it out but we're going to just go ahead and do uh, uh, of course 16 ounces which this cup is a ounce cup. Stuff it somewhere. So 24 ounce cup we've got 16 and then so we need 10 ounces essentially for 1.5 comparison. So before I mix that in, what we're going to do is grab our chop strand and go ahead and shred strips. This will ensure ease of operation. Now we're just going to do these little uh, four inch wide kind of tear offs. And the reason we're doing that is we're going to be covering this with uh, 1708 anyways. This is more just structural, get, get our, our footing down. And then the 1708 more chops channel will come later when we finally permatize this whole thing. That is an official word, permatize. And this is extra from the transom. I, I overdid it a little. I, I put like 20 layers on the transom and it was maybe a little bit much. I'm not going to say for certain whether it was too much, but... It was too much. All right, so that's got us as far as uh, setting up the inside of the boat. We got all five stringers in, uh, and they are fiberglass and drying. I had to cr crank up the temperature in here, which is why you hear the fan. Let's take a, a look at the uh, temp. So we've got 84 in the main room. We got 71 in here. So that's the minimum threshold for this stuff to dry. Uh, laminating resin needs uh, 65 to 80 uh, to 90 degrees. Much hotter than that, it tends to flash pretty quick. Much colder than that, and it'll just never harden up. So. I'm going to go ahead and put the um, uh, oil heater in here as well, uh, crank that up, get that just uh, continuing the temp. I'll probably let the fan continue to run for the next hour or so. The uh, resin only takes about two hours to fully cure, three hours to fully cure, to the point where I can remove the weights and um, move on to the next step, which will be uh, planing everything, getting everything perfectly flat across all three. And then obviously we have our floor, and then underneath the boat is the nose coming. Um, everything's pre-cut, ready to go, so once we get that, we'll just bevel the edges, drop it in, 
I've got the 1708 and the chop strand in that box up there for the floor. So we'll do four layers of chop strand and one layer of 1708 to really give it a, you know, and then we have some uh, really high end, uh, super low or high thread count uh, stuff. I don't know if I'm going to use it or not. It would be more for like a finishing job if you don't want that woven look. But if you look at the boat, you can actually see the the weave through the gel coat, which we'll probably keep with a similar look. Or we might go crazy nice. I, I don't know. I can't say yet. But we'll uh, check back in here once we uh, let this sit up a little while. the next day and our setup is starting to cure so we essentially have a, a hot tent going uh, the uh, oil heaters underneath there piping away at 80 degrees just kind of running heat out into the room I can't actually keep the shop up to temperature in its entirety it's a poorly insulated shop the roof has no um, ceiling nor does it have insulation so the heat bleeds off pretty quick so this is a great solution to kind of keep it hot in these sections and then I'll move it and cure the front end. What this means is we'll be on to uh, planing and then refiberglassing in the next video that'll be coming out in the next couple weeks. Um, I also have the new project that I just acquired that will be um, coming out. That video is almost done so stay tuned for that. I hope you've enjoyed this project today. Thanks for tuning in and hanging out this long. We'll see you on the next one.